On March the 31st, 1931, the iced up wooden wings of a Fokker tri-motor broke off in flight. The 14-seater plane crashed in Kansas, killing all those on board. That single crash shocked the nation. Yet only 45 years later, 576 people died in a crash at Tenerife in the Canary Islands. A lot has happened to aviation in those 45 years. Today, millions of people use airplanes as they once used buses. And yet, uh, some people are still a little apprehensive when they board a plane. So how safe is it to fly? Tonight, we'll try to answer this question by looking at the safety record of the planes and those who fly them. And at the aftermath of some moments in aviation history, when havoc struck. In the early days, the world of flying was the world of romance and adventure. Then, it took 33 hours and 20 minutes to fly from New York to San Francisco. The pioneers of flying became folk heroes, though to the average man in the street, the prospect of flying was still a remote one. Flying was pretty much the prerogative of the privileged few. But the invention that ultimately led to fast, long-distance air travel wasn't to come until the Second World War, when vast sums were poured into aircraft development. The first newsreel pictures of the prototype British Gloucester jet-propelled aircraft made to the design of Air Commodore Frank Whittle. The RAF flew the first squirt planes ever to go into action against the enemy, says a pilot who flew in the first jet squadron. The squirts have plenty of power, and if you open up the throttle suddenly, you get a kick in the back from your seat. They go up like a lift, the faster, the higher. They're sweet to handle, and it's jets for me from now on. Even before the end of the war, the vast British aircraft industry was planning to build the world's first jet passenger liner. And in 1949, the de Havilland Comet took off for the first time from the company's Hertfordshire airfield. It was a triumph. Group Captain Cat Eyes Cunningham, then as now, their chief test pilot, was at the controls. It went very smoothly, and the aeroplane, of course, with its jet engines, was an extremely smooth machine to fly. It had a big wing, and it took off from this airfield here, uh, in about half the length of the runway, and gave us great pleasure and satisfaction. Its ability to fly above the weather opened up a new world of comfortable and efficient air travel. And within three years, the Comet was in commercial service, cutting in half the journey time to Johannesburg. Wherever it went, the Comet set a new record. It had a performance equal to that of the fastest jet fighters of the day, and it went on to establish the first transatlantic jet passenger service. The airlines of the world were clamoring to buy it. The British aircraft industry looked set to lead the world in the new jet age, when havoc struck. Not once, but three times, the dream was shattered. On Saturday, May the 2nd, 1953, as a British expedition neared the summit of Everest and Queen Elizabeth prepared for her coronation in Westminster Abbey, news came from Calcutta that Comet Yoke Victor had mysteriously vanished minutes after takeoff over the remote Indian village of Jukulgaru. When the wreckage was finally discovered, sections of the plane were lying eight miles from the body of the fuselage. All 43 passengers had perished. I think I heard in the morning, and uh, uh, naturally it was a tremendous disappointment uh, without knowing at that time anything about the reason for the accident. The mystery was still unsolved eight months later when an Italian fisherman at Castiglione spotted a silver jet high in the clear blue sky. As he watched, it suddenly turned into a black plume of smoke and streaked down to meet the sea. Seconds later, a column of smoke rose from the water like a passing monument. The second comet had crashed and another 35 people were dead. The Royal Navy immediately embarked on a search for the wreckage of the crash plane and using underwater television cameras, managed to recover 70% of the ill-fated airliner. But even as they worked, 
another comet took off from nearby Rome Airport, reached 26,000 feet and exploded in midair. It was almost a carbon copy of the previous disaster. In the short space of a year, three comets had fallen from the sky, killing 110 people and no one knew why. Government investigators submerged an entire comet airframe in a special tank and by substituting water pressure for air pressure, simulated flight. At the same time, the reconstructed plane was beginning to provide clues. How had a piece of cabin carpet lodged in the tailplane? And how had a coin from a passenger's pocket become embedded in the comet's outer skin? By painstaking deduction, the sequence of the plane's disintegration could now be determined. And then the breakthrough came. On the 24th of June, after the comet had flown a simulated 9,000 hours, the pressure gauges suddenly dropped to zero. When the tank was drained, a crack eight feet long was found in the skin of the cabin, and aircraft makers had discovered the complex and lethal effects of metal fatigue. In death, the comet bequeathed to its successors, indeed, to every plane that has flown ever since, that one vital piece of information. Although de Havilland went on to make the comet safe, the British industry had lost the initiative. From now on, there was to be a clear divergence in attitudes between the European and the American plane makers. The Europeans thought the future lay in speed and went on to build the fast and prestigious planes like the VC-10 and ultimately the Concorde. But the Americans decided to concentrate on mass air transit and in October of 1958, the first Boeing 707 entered service. The signal is all clear and down the runway at Renton Airport, Seattle, thunders the 95-ton sky giant on... It was the first jet passenger plane to be produced in America and it revolutionized the industry. For it pulled the carpet away from under the feet of the Douglas Corporation, the established plane maker who had filled the skies of the world with 11,000 of their legendary Dakotas alone. And congratulations go to the pilot for blazing a new trail in the sky. The name of the game was predicting the direction of the rapidly expanding market and exploiting it. And Boeing consistently succeeded in producing the right plane at the right time. The 727, launched in 1963, sold more than any other civil aircraft ever built. And in 1968, the first jumbo rolled out onto the runway at Seattle. The next generation had been born. At an international air show, you get a good idea of the rivalry between plane makers. It's a, a shop window for the airlines, the military, and even the private buyer. The pressure to show off a plane to its limits has often led to disaster. At Farnborough, England, in 1952, patriotic crowds watched their hero, test pilot John Derry, die from eight miles up in his new jet fighter. As he swooped low over the airfield, the plane broke up killing 27 spectators. At the famous Paris Air Show in 1973, the Russians amazed the world with their gleaming new SST Tupolev 144. Television viewers across the world watched eagerly to see if it could outperform its great rival, the Anglo-French Concorde. But to their horror, the Soviet jetliner attempted to pull too sharply out of a dive and disintegrated. The wreckage rained down on the community of Goosenville, killing six inhabitants. The competition for Airbus sales between McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed never reached these extremes, but had nevertheless been just as intense. Since the specification of the two proposed planes was virtually identical, the commercial victory would go to the manufacturer that flew his plane first, and Douglas won. American was the first airline to order DC-10s. And the events that took place in one of their aircraft over Windsor, Ontario on the 12th of June, 1972, were to provide a warning of a design deficiency in the plane, 
A drama began that day that was to end two years later in the forest of Ermenonville, outside Paris, when 346 people paid with their lives. Flight 96 took off from Detroit for Buffalo. Five minutes later, at about 11,000 feet, there was a loud bang. The cabin depressurized. The rudder pedals in the cockpit shot in different directions, and a cloud of gray dust blinded the pilot. The flight deck door burst open, and the huge aircraft decelerated, pitching downward and throwing the 56 passengers forward. A damp white fog enveloped everything inside the aircraft. Mr. and Mrs. Kaminsky were on the flight over Windsor. I mean, you know, everything just happened so quickly. The, the vapor, the plane dropping, being hit immediately. You know, all of these things in a row, and the, the only thing you think of is immediately you're going to die. That's it. Below, flight attendant Sandra McConnell had fallen with the partially collapsed floor and was desperately fighting for her balance. She could see the clouds rushing beneath her feet. She was sucked in, and they grabbed her just in time. So naturally, you know, by the time we landed, she was quite hysterical. Amazingly, pilot Bruce McCormick brought the plane under control and, using the power of the engines to steer, landed back at Detroit Airport. The plane landed, which was as you would normally land, but instead of being stable, it immediately began to pick up speed. And as it picked up speed, it began to bounce so that Unless you were strapped in, you could have easily, you felt like you were going to go right through the roof of the plane. And as it, you know, it kept picking up speed, it kept going faster and faster. And you just got the feeling that you were just going to crash into something. And uh, I was hysterical about that, hysterical about dying, very truthfully. And of course, the only thing I could just keep thinking was that I would just never see my children again. You know, it stopped, they, the stewardess opened the chutes and said, leave everything, get out immediately. And it was summer and I had no shoes on and went halfway across the runway in my bare feet. You're in such a state of shock. A gentleman walked up to me and he said, please put your arm around me, I'm a doctor. And I said, no, I'm fine. And he said, when you look down and see your foot, you're going to pass out, which I immediately did. <laughs> Didn't pass out, I just happened to look down. And of course there was nothing there but exposed bone. You think it's never going to happen to you. It's something that you read about, but it's never going to really happen to you, and there's nothing you can do. The survival of Flight 96 was little short of a miracle. Surely following this failure of the cargo door locking system, all possible precautions would immediately be taken to ensure that it would never happen again. Yet, nearly two years later, as a Turkish Airlines DC-10 climbed away from Paris en route to London. The cargo door blew out again. This time, there was no miracle to save the passengers and crew. I can't bring it up. It doesn't respond. Nothing's left. We've lost it. We're going to hit the ground. swath half a mile long and 120 yards wide as it plowed through the woods. The birds stopped singing, the trees fell still, and an eerie silence enveloped the forest. I saw two or three people absolutely dazed, completely bewildered. They told me, don't go, don't go. There are bodies everywhere, in the trees, there are pieces all over the place. It's a Turkish aircraft. The forest was dead silent. I had the feeling that life had suddenly stopped. I walked all over the site for 15 minutes. I realized very quickly that I wouldn't find anyone alive. The scene was quite simply beyond the normal range of human emotional comprehension. Moments before, 346 people had been alive. Now they were engulfed in an avalanche of disintegrating steel. Ultimately, there seems little point in trying to place blame. After all, nothing can now bring back the lives of those 346 people. We must never forget the lessons of the DC-10 crash.
do the manufacturers and operators of planes pay enough attention to safety? Well, we've come here to the Boeing plant in Seattle to find out what those problems are and what is being done to solve them. This is N7470, the first jumbo to be built. Nine years after its first flight, it is still flying as a test bed for the latest innovations and developments. This aerial laboratory computes some 2,000 measurements from sensors in every part of the plane. The 747 test program represents four years of continuous work, cost $165 million, and has incorporated more than 1,300 individual tests. 747 models spent more than 12,000 hours in wind tunnels. So if you're one of those people who worries when they see the wings moving, this is what a jumbo can withstand. This test, when a plane was deliberately taken off at too great an angle, was one of the more dramatic ones. A jumbo is so safe that it could land automatically in a thunderstorm on only two engines, with all its weight on one landing gear, have three of the four main hydraulic systems fail, lose its anti-skid mechanism, burst all its tires, and still come to a safe stop. planes are made, the airways of the world are becoming more and more crowded. The alertness of the pilot, the quality of air traffic control, bad weather, and sometimes the sheer runway congestion can still combine in extreme circumstances to bring disaster. Such a fatal combination of circumstances came together on the morning of April the 11th, 1977, at Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Nobody was, I wasn't paying attention, I was reading or something. And all of a sudden... This was the disaster that everyone had dreaded. Two 312-ton jumbo jets crashed into each other with such force and explosive impact that metal parts from both were vaporized in the ensuing fire. One, a KLM plane, had begun an unauthorized takeoff roll when Pan Am's clipper Victor loomed out of the fog. Captain Grubbs frantically veered left. The KLM pilot throttled hard to lift off, risking an almost certain stall, but he failed to clear the Pan Am jet by just 25 feet. An investigator said later he probably knew he had no chance himself. He was just trying to save us. fast as you can. I really think that we probably were some of the first people out of the plane because uh, the majority that got off were up in the front of the plane. No, I was stuck in, a, in the nose cone of the, of the uh, front of the aircraft. My wife and I and maybe five or six other people. We got lucky because we were dead. We were just as dead as anything with the, because our whole capsule was just one ball of flame. Something blew up, and it knocked the flames away long enough for the, for the uh, for us to get out. One couple said that they were with friends and their friends just sat as if they were petrified. They didn't make any effort to get up or get out. They just were so uh, shocked, I guess. The Paris crash had doubled the worst previous casualty figure. Now it was virtually doubled again. It soon became clear that of the 643 passengers, 576 had been killed. I'm lucky. One of the very, very lucky people. I spent the night in the hospital because of this, but it burned, but that's nothing.
chances of a reoccurrence of the Tenerife disaster are reassuringly slim. But it is the possibility of human error that the industry must constantly work to minimize. Our rate of descent is about six, seven hundred feet a minute, which is about where it should be for this time of the approach. We're now passing through 500 feet and we're crossing over the middle marker. That's the little amber light that was flashing over to the right. Now, we've gone maybe 50 feet or 75 feet high on the glide slope. I'm going to take, it, so take we'll... it to the left now, right? Right. Okay. Here we come around. I'm going to keep it right, right down the middle, right? Right. Uh-huh. Now, I'm going to make a correction. Mm -hmm. Right here now, get over onto the center line. Our speed is about where we want it. Okay, here we come. Okay, there's 100 feet right about here. We start to flare. Right. 50 feet, bring the nose up slightly, bring the thrust back. Keeps wanting to go to the right. <laughs> here we go. There we are, we're right on. 25. Touchdown. And now we'll go into reverse. We want to stay right on the center line while we're reversing. And we'll apply the brakes, bring it to a nice orderly stop. How about that? Right down the middle, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. This simulator we just landed is exactly the same as a real 747. You can actually feel the bumps as you taxi down the runway, but it's no toy. Today, the majority of pilot training is done on machines such as this. The machinery of modern air travel is so sophisticated and its designers so safety conscious that it needs a truly extraordinary set of circumstances to occur before anything dangerous results. Today, traveling by air is twice as safe as traveling by car. And if airlines maintain high safety standards, air travel will become even safer. But we must remember that the airplane, however miraculous, is only a device for overcoming the, the physical universe. A universe coldly unforgiving of mistakes. As Rudyard Kipling once wrote, we hold all earth to plunder, all time and space as well. Two wonders stale to wonder at each new miracle. Then in the mid-illusion of Godhead in our hand falls multiple confusion on all we thought or planned. The mighty works we planned.